Sean Haney here with RealAgriculture.com and Real Ag Radio, World Radio 147, Sirius XM. Let's talk markets. Joined right now by Ted Seifert. He's with Zanarag Hedge, based out of Chicago, Illinois. Ted, great to see you. Always a pleasure to see you, Sean. Thanks for having me. Okay, uh, I guess uh, from a broad perspective, how would you explain these markets right now? How, how are we trading? Yeah, you know, it's a weather market. Uh, um, first of all, we are well off our highs. We've been in a downtrend for, for grains and uh, oil seeds, you know, corn, wheat, soybeans, everything. It's been in a downtrend since the beginning of the year. But just in the last couple of weeks or so, we've kind of picked ourselves off the lows, most notably in corn. And a lot of that's because we've gotten kind of dry here over the past month. Um, and, and by kind of dry, I mean really rather dry, right? Uh, there's a lot of comparisons being made right now to 2012 and how we are maybe actually in a worse scenario right now than we were at this time in 2012. Uh, the problem with that is that, you know, the, the, the forecasters, the, the guys that know a lot more about it than I do, are telling me that, yeah, this is temporary. Things are going to get a lot better through the second half of June into July and August. And if that happens, well, then this, this strength that we're seeing is really rather, rather temporary. The thing about it is, you know, the markets had the, the, the opportunity to sort of focus on the supply side and the prob potential problems for the supply side of the equation for the last couple of weeks. It's taken our focus off of the demand problem that we have after years of high prices. Mm. And so while we're focusing on that supply side and not focusing on the demand side, again, it can allow for some higher prices. But as soon as we kind of fix the supply side problem, if the rains start to happen, well, then we're going to go back to looking at the demand side of the equation. And that's not a very rosy picture, Sean. And that's really the thorn in the side that we've had since the beginning of the year. You know, we, for the life of us, we can't get our corn exports going. Our soybean exports had been good, but they've really slowed down. We don't have a whole lot of unshipped bushels out there. In order to hit the USDA's target, we need to see some more sales in soybeans. We're just not really getting them right now. Uh, and it's not really the time of year where we should be getting, especially after a really solid uh, first season Brazilian soybean crop. So, again, if and when we get back to focusing on demand, which will come with the rains, uh, then you got to look out below. There's, there's, there's issues, right? So there's a potential for quite a bit of, of movement to the downside. So, but for the moment, you know, while we're still dry, we could see some higher prices, but we need to be taking advantage of that, I think. I was just going to, that's exactly what I was just going to ask you. This, this, what we've been hearing from analysts over the past number of weeks is, you know, sell, take some risk off the table, sell into some of the rallies, uh, look at them as opportunities to offload some risk. That's what I'm hearing from you as well here. Uh, provided that we do get that rain at the back end of June, beginning of July. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple ways to work with that. And first of all, I want to be a technical trader and, and give people a technical point on a chart where I would like to see a whole bunch of order stacks, you know, either to sell cash or HCAs or, or you know, sell futures. And for for that, in December corns five sixty, you're just shy of five sixty. And for November beans is twelve forty, or again just shy of twelve forty. The problem is, it's hard to be a technical trader in a weather market, right? Because you know you can have these these chart objectives, but as soon as the rain starts happening, you can throw all that out the window. So. To your point, I think you got to kind of scale in, and I think now is a great time to start doing that. If you get a chance, if we get a chance to sell more aggressively at uh, again five fifty seven December corn, I think you should sell a really nice chunk of that there. It, I'd really like to see people up to sixty five percent sold on this bounce. I know that's going to be uncomfortable for some because of the dryness. Because hey, you know, I, I, I have a hard time selling a crop that I'm not sure I'm going to have. Well, yes, but sixty percent. I mean, we're all going to have you know, 60% of a crop really should. Hmm. Um, but there's other ways to approach it too. Like if you, if you think there's more upside potential, if you think this weather issue is going to continue to linger, you can buy calls against cash sales, you know, to, to reown those bushels and participate in more of a rally if we're going to get one. Call options are actually relatively cheap to where they've been trading the last couple of years. Um, the other thing you can do, if you don't want to actually commit to selling bushels, you can buy puts. Uh, buying puts, you know, create a $5 floor in December corn, Hey, that's not a terrible thing. Uh, you know, historically speaking, five dollars is a great price for our, our, our new crop corn. It's not the prices we've been seeing the last couple of years, but it's still a really good price. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a number of different ways to approach this, depending on your level of comfort with, I mean, the potential for margin calls and things like that. 
um, depending on your comfort of what you have as a crop to sell. Uh, but one way or another, you know, you really do have to get fairly aggressive on your marketing because if you wait to the end of the year, if you wait to harvest this year, it could really be a problem, especially if you paid a whole lot more inputs back in October. And that that big problem being driven by the weakness in demand in the back half of 23 into Q1 of 24? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you look at the second season corn crop happening in Brazil right now, it is going to be a lot better than what we were originally expecting. And, you, you know, that uh, a portion of that crop got planted late. So there was initially some concerns about it. But now you look down there and the analysts continue to, to up their their numbers. So that's going to be uh, a headwind for us uh, as far as we're going to have to compete with that Brazilian corn crop. We know China is now buying Brazilian corn. Uh, I think China has designs to buy as much of that Brazilian corn as they can to avoid us. So that's a problem for us. Um, and, and again, the high prices are the cure for high prices. I don't love cliches, but that's a really good one. You see global demand kind of tailing off because, again, we've been at years of high prices. Our exports this year are the lowest they've been in 10 years. Uh, and that could carry over into next year unless we have much lower prices. And therein lies the rub, right? It's I mean, a lot of people think that. <laughs> yes, exactly. So a lot of people think in like 480 to 450 should be the floor for December corn. You know, I mean, that's. I understand that argument, but really that argument's based on fundamentals that we were trading six months ago. That's not based on fundamentals that we have right now. My concern, Sean, is that in order to buy that demand back, we might have to go well below those those numbers. We might have to go into the low floor, low fours, possibly even high threes. And that's sort of a catastrophic situation for guys that, again, have paid a whole lot of inputs. Now, there are some some guys that waited to the spring to buy a bulk of their their inputs. They're not in as bad of a, of a position as far as that's concerned. But either way, this was probably the highest risk corn crop that we've ever planted. You've got to be cognizant of that, and you've got to be fairly aggressive with marketing, especially when you have a fifty cent bounce off of lows like we've just had, Sean. Do you feel the same? Like are are wheat, corn, and soybeans facing the exact same demand scenario? Are, are they kind of in an equal bundle there, relatively speaking? Uh, I've been really kind of focusing on corn with that. Yeah. I, I, you can say that wheat demand has just been a real struggle. And that's sort of been tailing off for a couple of years now. One, we've got more global competition. Two, the dollar has been quite a bit stronger than than most other currencies. And three, you know, just kind of a change in, in, in diets, not just here in the United States, kind of led by us in the United States, but, you know, North America as a whole. The whole, whole world. So wheat demand kind of fading as supply comes on from the rest of the world. It's why we really haven't gotten this big boost out of that, the Russia invading Ukraine and so on and so forth. I mean, we did initially, but we've not been able to hold on to that, obviously. Um, and then soybeans is sort of the last one there. Soybean demand has kind of hung in there or had at least until the world knew that that first season Brazilian crop was there. But even if you look at a balance sheet for next year, Sean, the soybean balance sheet at a 300 to 335 million bushel carryover isn't overly burdensome like a 2.2, 2.3 billion bushel carryover in corn. So the soybeans might hold on to a little bit of that balance sheet tightness uh, unless there's a big shift in acreage, which we won't know yet until the end of this month. But um yeah, you know, the soybeans, I, I'm the least demand bearish on soybeans. I'm the most demand bearish on corn. Wheat's kind of in the middle, but probably closer to corn. Um, so that's an interesting question. You do kind of have to look at them separately. But in, in in a broader picture, high prices everywhere has caused some sort of demand dis destruction. It's just there's a higher degree of that demand destruction that has happened in corn than there has been for soybeans, at least to this point. That's great stuff. Hey, Ted, thanks so much for joining us here this week. Really appreciate it. Ted Seifert, Zanarag Hedge. Ted, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. Take care, buddy.